Hello, Matthew. I'm delighted to be chatting with such a prolific screenwriter, director, producer, teacher, and actor. Oh, thank Dr. you. Steve Evans. Oh, thanks. Thank you so much, Terry. It's lovely to see you. Oh, it nice hey, it's, uh, it's, great, it's uh, great to meet you. And um, you're in LA. So what's it like in LA today? Is it nice and sunny? Unlike us when we've got a rather cold <laughs> environment. But Yep. What have you got? Um, uh, are you, you, well, yesterday it was raining. So we've, we've got the El Nino is sort of covering the world with strange weather. But, <laughs> but any kind yeah. of weather is, is welcome in LA. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. The weather's been a bit up and down, topsy turvy over the past few weeks, particularly. Heavy rain, heavy winds, all sorts. But anyway, moving on, before we talk about your brilliant creative career, Tell us what you do outside work, you know, hobbies, uh, interests, anything like that. Gosh. Monopolies, I like maybe? I like Monopoly. Monopoly. The Monopoly in the background there, yes. Um, but no, it's still got the wrapper on it. I, I like playing Monopoly <laughs> a lot. I used to play it a lot with the kids when they were little. And it was always a, it was always an acting kind of exercise, not not deliberately. But, but my boys would, would sort of adopt the character of whatever the little avatar was that they were coming <laughs> around. And every time they did something, they would, they would sort of really get into it. Um, <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was great. No, I like that. I like hiking. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know. It's a long time since I've filled out a dating profile. Um, <laughs> there's, there's not much else to say um yes i like i think i love obviously i love reading a lot and and um, i love movies and it's pretty much i mean that's why i kind of moved out to moved to los angeles was it's nice to be in a, a in a city that's devoted to the things that you love doing I was originally from Golders Green. Well, I suppose Golders Green, St John's Wood. I don't know, somewhere like that in yeah. in, in in London. Um, and then um, you know, and then events took over, and we ended up moving all over the place. My dad was an actor, so we moved oh. around a bit. And uh, but uh, but basically, basically London, and then we lived for a short while in Hexworthy in Devon. Um, in Dartmoor, um, and then we and then we moved from there around about 1964, 65, um, 65, I think. We moved to Harlow in Essex. I don't know if you know that place. Um, yeah, it's yeah. A new, it was very much a new town then. Um, uh, and I went to school there at um, at um, Stewart's Comprehensive School um, and Durand's Primary, and. Uh, and then I got out of there as um, soon as I could, really. And uh, I'm yeah. not that I didn't like the place. It's, it was just, um, um, you know, it's like one of those Disney movies. I want to be where the people. So I, got, I, I, was, I was lucky enough to get in. I was a child actor. And then I was lucky enough to get into the National Youth Theatre, um, which, and so that meant that I could go to London. At about this, at the sweet age of seventeen or whatever, however old I was. Wow. Anyway, you're getting my life story. Yeah, that's yeah. what I do. I do other no, stuff, no, no. but 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 mostly it's connected with, because like you said, you know, because I because I regard I I wear my hyphens. I'm a, as they what they call a multi hyphenate. Um, I wear my sort of hyphens with pride. Um, I, I like the fact that I do a lot of acting and I like the fact that I do a lot of writing and directing and producing, coaching, teaching. You know, I just keep busy, but it's all around the sort of same, the same thing. Um, uh, and uh, so, so especially since, you know, since, since the previous writer's strike in 2008, um, I started doing quite a bit more sort of coaching and consulting and teaching at various universities. And, um, and I really enjoyed the idea of making my own films, which because it's sort of, sort of energized by the fact that I was working with young filmmakers anyway. Um, and so that's where films like um, Your Good Friend and uh, Bar America and 
and certainly the stuff that I do with um, Bernard Rose. Um, I'm watching that tonight. Smart, smart money. What is it called? Oh my God! You're watching Smart Money. I've got it lined up for after this uh, chat. 1996. Hacker. No, no, it was 1986. Oh, was it? Oh, I'm, I can't read my own writing. It's, it's a really cheesy. Sorry. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> <It's pausing now. laughs> there are better films of mine to watch. Put it like that. <laughs> Which one would you recommend, then, Matthew? I'll, I'll get rid have of Smart seen, Money. Have you ever seen? I mean, Smart Money is good, but it was Bernard's first film. It was my first um, feature film that kind of I'd you know when I left film school or when I was at film school, yeah. I was writing. Um, Anything that anything that could get made, I took the philosophy that if it can get made, I want my name on it because I knew that if you were a writer who had had a film made, it's like you you've been in the races, as it were. It's like yeah. you 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 you. So I was writing ninja movies. There's a film called <laughs> Ninja Mission, which is a, the only Swedish ninja movie around. 1984. Yeah, that's right. That's when that got 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 finished. Um, and uh, and then uh, another film which was I think called Starship or Lorca and the Outlaws or whatever that was by Roger Christian who went on who had already got an Oscar he was at film school with me and he'd already got an Oscar he'd also worked with Ridley Scott I'd worked as a runner for RSA so Ridley Scott certainly wouldn't remember me but I was just running around with film cans at the age of sort of 16 Some and company. he'd He'd been working for he'd been working for Ridley. He'd been the art director on Alien, and he'd also been the the uh, the uh, um, set decorator on Star Wars, the first Star Wars. And so he already had two Oscars when he arrived wow. at the film school. So he didn't really spend much time at the film school. Um, he so as a result, we teamed up, and uh, and I wrote a science fiction project for him that was my first thing yeah but mm -hmm. other films to watch i would recommend the first film um that i wrote that that i that i can honestly say wasn't well i smart money was was good yeah. i'm interested to see that you can even find it um <laughs> that's amazing i mean i don't even have a copy i mean i really don't um oh. it's a it's an interesting film because it was it was one of those at that time Channel 4 had just started making films. The BBC were dipping their toes in that water and making little, making these little films. And so we, so we made Smart Money was developed by National Film Finance Corporation by Colin oh, yeah. Vaines. Yeah. And, and it was going to be with Roger Christian directing. And it was going to be at Handmade. Um, and, and the budget was just ballooning and ballooning and ballooning. And then Bernard was who I'd been writing by then. I think I'd already been writing Paper House for him. Um, but Bernard and I were good friends. And and uh, and then then what happened was was that it looked like Smart Money wasn't going to happen at Handmade. Um, and so so my agent, who was very smart, um, who's still my agent, Sue Rogers, at, at Independent Talent. She she sent along um, she sent along smart money to Richard Brooke, who had made made stuff like the monocle mutineer and things like that. Paul McGann, so, yeah, connection with Paul. Yeah. And so so um, and, and Richard had it on his desk, and and Bernard saw that it was there. And being a good friend, he said, "Oh, that's a work of genius." Wow. So, so he hadn't read it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, he, so, um, so, um, so Brooke read it that weekend or got back in touch with Sue, and, and I suddenly realized, oh, he's going to make this because the other project he wanted to do with Bernard, he ended up doing later, but they couldn't get it off the ground at that time. So, so, um, so uh, it was very funny. So I called. Bernard and I said, Bernard, on Monday, you're going to be offered that script that you said was so wonderful to direct. Um, you should read it. <laughs> and he went, really, really? Yeah. So he read it. And yeah. and and it was his first feature length um, film. And so it's so it's got all those sort of wonderful rough edges that come with 
one's one's first attempt at doing a feature length. You know, up until then, Bernard had yes, he'd done films, but he 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 hadn't really done a feature length film at all. He'd done a lot of a lot of pop videos and, and things like that. I'm still gonna so, watch it, even though you said it was yeah, cheesy. Watch it because it's what I, 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 and tell me what you think, Terry. T- seriously, okay. well, but then. but they but the uh, the one the first one that I was really proud of, I think. I mean, I'm proud of all of the stuff. The one 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 was Paper House, which Bernard directed, was the second film we did for Working Title, okay. and was an adaptation of of uh, that would really be better to watch because yeah. it's it's really that film. You know that film got us noticed everywhere. Yeah. Um, the person who got behind that was um, uh, Roger Ebert. We took it to the went to the Toronto Film Festival, and he's the and film critic, he, isn't he? He writes the. That's right. He he's sadly he's passed now, but but he was he was one of the leading film critics in America, certainly in the late eighties, which is by the time we'd finished. Um, Paper House was was the thing. He's still, so we he, were, he's still got the credits, hasn't he? They still got his. When I look at MRQE to see, you know, ratings how the critics rate a film, he's still got his own column on there. Although there's different writers oh, yeah. all the time. Even though he's passed away, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Could, could we split this into three parts? Well, we course, talk about yeah. your behind the camera screenwriting and filmmaking work, and then talk about your acting work, and then maybe talk about your teaching work. Why not? Brilliant. That would be lovely. Thank you. To tell us how you, you, well, I think you told us actually. I was going to ask you how you got started in the industry, but you, I think you've gone into great detail and absolutely superb. Well, yeah, I mean, basically, I was a, basically my dad was an actor, I was yeah. a child actor. Um, I ended up National Youth Theatre, I ended up not getting disenchanted with acting. Yeah. Um, then went, went and got a job. I thought I was getting a job at the Royal School of Art, but it was RSA. Oh. Um, which was with the <laughs> Scott Associates. Yeah. So, so, so I ended up, um, and the only re- prerequisite to getting that job was, can you get here? Can you find <laughs> us? <laughs> <laughs> so I went. I went. Okay. So I took a taxi. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I got started in the film industry. Really. <laughs> um, and then sometimes you just have to show up. Yeah. Um, uh, and and you have to keep showing up. That's the thing. Um, <laughs> That's the secret. You know, you have to, and if you keep knocking at the door long enough, somebody's going to answer. It's it's. I was, I was a great filmmaker called Sorrento. I can't remember. He was saying that in his sort of broken Italian at the screening I saw a couple of years ago. Yeah. Somebody said, well, "How do you get going?" And and he said, it's "Very simple. You just keep on knocking." <laughs> um, uh, and, and, oh, okay. I mean. Just moving on slightly, uh, amongst your many writing credits, you wrote the screenplay of the TV film version of the cult classic Doctor Who series, and you know, starring uh, Paul McGann. Um, and Paul McGann made that that great line, didn't he? Oh, you yeah. know, uh, how, how does it go again? Doctor, I always get this wrong. I, I should have wrote it down. And I knew. <coughs> excuse Doctor me. Doctor Who am I? <laughs> Doctor Who am I? So yeah, what a fantastic! Well, who am I? I? He he yells, yeah, because he doesn't know who he is. That was the that was the pitch, you know. You're absolutely right, Steve. I mean, that was the that was the pitch that basically got me the TV movie to write. Um, I said, so let's have him regenerate from from the seventh to the eighth, and then and then um, he doesn't. And then the regeneration goes wrong, and then he doesn't know who he is. And as he's discovering who he is, so does the audience, um, because we were trying to sort of set it up as a, as an American show. Um, that seemed to be a popular idea. So do you think that's um, probably what you're best known for? Or is that? Well, um, yes, certainly this year. You know, it's, it's certainly this year because it's the 60th. And, and so... You know, I, I I think that's probably why I'm doing these podcasts, and and also yeah. also we made a documentary called Doctor Who Am I that's a, I think available on BritBox and ITVX yeah. in the UK, um, and and uh, Doctor Who Am I is I've been travelling around with that and it's directed by Vanessa Yule and myself, but but primarily by Vanessa who who edited it, and it's a it's a it's a it's sort of taken off a lot so so 
because Doctor Who Am I, I don't know whether you've seen it, is is not really so much about Doctor Who. It's it's about myself and the fans and 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 the sort of ideas and the ideas behind um, fandom and things like that. So it's sort of it meanders, but at the end of the day, it's kind of a a sort of a, a weird a weird self portrait, which is in fact painted by a friend, painted by Vanessa. Um, and um, so it's really a, a film born of friendship. Um, most, most films are sort of, most documentaries are born of some kind of worthy desire. Um, ours is just an expression of friendship. That's, that's going on my list as well. <laughs> oh, you should definitely watch it. I am. You should definitely watch it because in a way, Doctor Who Am I is, is uh, um, you know, it is a better guide to all the other films like sort of Lassie and, you know, oh, in yeah. the Indiana Jones. I was going to ask you about the young Indiana Jones. How did you get to be a part of George Lucas' team? You were knocking on doors, you were knocking on George Lucas. Yes, door. that's right. It was just, it's just, just you just got to keep knocking. <laughs> but, 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 it's, but also, you build up a bit of a reputation. I mean, that's what happens, right? So, so, um, uh, I mean, so it's really about, um, I mean, uh, my initial philosophy of just, of, of just making stuff that gets made. Uh, when I was at film school, that approach really came from sort of being inspired by Francis Coppola and, and by um, and by uh, Roger Corman. Um, Roger Corman's sort of influence on cinema, where he just he made B movies basically, but mm. but he he was a tremendous supporter. Is I think he's still around. Gosh, um, I, 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 a, a tremendous tremendous supporter of of um, film schools and film schools were young at that stage. So, yeah, so I actually had a Roger Corman grant at the National Film School. They gave me a grant which enabled me to live because I didn't have much money. So I lived in the sort of what we called the accommodation block, um, which was next to the, one of the stages. And, and um, but yeah, so, so I got the young indie, um, but just simply because they were looking for, at that point, they were looking for writer directors. Uh, 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 initially, it was going to be, it was more of an educational project. And they wanted, they wanted um, writers who could direct as well, because that's certainly, you know, and, and they weren't going to spend too much money. And, and it was um, George and it was Rick, who, Rick and Cullum, who put, who put this together. And so I was on a list because I'd just done a film called Hallelujah Anyhow, uh, which was a BBC One, um, you know, a B BBC Two, I think, drama, uh, Screen Two, and, and it had done very well. Um, and we, I just finished it. I just finished it. But already we knew it was going to be at Sundance. We knew it was going to be at the London Film Festival. So I was what they call hot. Um, uh, and, and as a result, my agent was running around. And so I'm in the middle of actually finishing. I was in the middle of, I think, of finishing shoot. I hadn't even started editing. No, I must have edited. Yeah, anyway, so it was a while ago. But, but I remember the first interview for Young Indy was when I was just finishing shooting. And, uh, and, uh, and I got this call from um, Sue saying, would you like to do this? Of course. Yeah. And my, <laughs> my it, was, it was like, and especially because my wife, um, Stephanie Yuka, um, uh, at that time, um, she, 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 she desperately wanted to get back to America. She'd done her postgrad in America and she'd fallen in love with San Francisco. And so this was a great, fantastic opportunity. Yeah, you know, sometimes good things happen. You're going around, and and it must have happened with you. Um, you know, you you something comes along that you've been hoping for, and I think I think Young Indy was that because I'd done Smart Money, I'd done Paper House, I'd done a whole pile. Of, I'd done some stuff for Jim Henson, a thing called Monster Maker. Um, and I was just, and I'd done mystery shows like Ruth Randall and, and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So, so I was sort of kind of qualified 
for it. And I and I also love, 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 love history. And so so you talk about things, hiking and finding out about stuff that's gone on. And those two things are great because you get so inspired when you look. And it's also you get inspired. Also, it's important. It's important to look back, you know, because there's so much going on in the world that's a product um, of history, especially today. And, um, and so it's it's really important to be able to go back and say, yes, I want to find out about you know what really was the Balfour Declar Declaration, what was the Sykes Pico Agreement, you know, what were those things? And that in Young Indy, it was a chance to sort of stimulate people's interest in history. That's really what the aim of that show was. Okay. Um, because early 20th century history wasn't really taught that well, um, isn't still isn't taught that well. And, and that's a particular passion of Lucas's. Okay. Yeah. Do, do you find then, as um, with your role as a director, I mean, screenwriting uh, to one side, of course, uh, mm. was that director stuff, was that enhanced by your writing background in the first place and the plot lines and the character? Uh, was that insight gained originally from your storytelling background or does, is it, is so, it completely so I would have said it's kind of the other way around with me. It's, it's, it's like, because I started out as an actor, then I went to study drama and then I, then I, then I didn't, and then I stopped acting, became a runner, a messenger and an assistant film editor, fell in love with movies. But then I decided, Huh. I should I, I should go to university you know so so and that's where where um you know this especially Tony Scott was very encouraging and <laughs> every they were all very encouraging and I got into I got into Hull University drama department which at that point had Anthony Mangella um, as the as one of the tutors there and there's Mike Walton and the whole bunch of really but they only took eight special students each year and I don't know how on earth I got in but again it was I think I, I on the day of the interviews it was like they said doing a do a pretend you're in an opera you know it was the <laughs> early 70s um so <laughs> pretend, <laughs> pretend you're in an opera so everybody was running around on the stage going Whoa! you know being, being very operatic and I just decided to sing Cliff Richard. Um, congratulations. <laughs> and, 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 and so I think I kind of stuck out because of that. So I ended up being the one person from that day of interviews that sort of got through. And then at Hull, I was, I was really focused on acting and directing, especially directing. I've, by that time, I was in love with the idea of being a director. So I directed. So I was. So Steve, I was directing first, and I was acting, um, and then, uh, right. and then when I went to, and then as I was finishing Hull, um, there were two paths. Um, there was one path which was to apply for the regional um, repertory theatre assist trainee to, to assistant director job if they at that point they'd take in about 15 of these people my brother ended up doing that my brother went to manchester and he's a he's a marvelous radio writer and tv writer and, and writer generally um, and he lives in manchester which is not too far yeah, um, road. from where you are and uh and he's um anyway he ended up doing that i went to have an interview for it and i think my fly burst before I went into the interview. What? So, 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 so all I could think about was this panel of very important looking theatre people. Um, all they can see is my underpants. Um, and that's really all they can see. And because I was thinking that, every time they asked me a question, I, I, I just didn't know, and I, I didn't know how to answer it. You know, they, they asked they ask a question like, it's the opening night of your of your play, and you realize that you have totally miscast the leading character. What do you do? Uh, pull I, the zip up. I, 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 
I wouldn't miscast the leading oh, character. <laughs> what do you, do you, you know, what, what, what kind of a question? I, so I was really bad. Um, and they said, so who's your favourite actor? And, I, and the only actor I could think of had died two years previously. Oh, um, so it was like, I totally messed that up. So I thought my life was over. Um, and they and the, the university, I said, well, I do want to apply for National Film School because because it's great. So, so I went through the list of things that you're meant to have. I then applied for the National, for the National Film School and I got in there. And there, I would, my focus was editing um, and directing because I directed three little films at university. One with one with uh, the local fishermen's union called South African Lobster, which was like forty minutes long, which nobody I can't even find out. I, I, it was <laughs> literature and homicide arts paid for, primarily paid for it. Anyway, those films got me into the National Film School. So at film school, I was really hoping to be a director. And I, in fact, I'd taken a play by Steve Gooch called Female Transport that Ron Daniels had directed at the other place. Um, and uh, and uh, I was going to adapt that. And and I was using part of the film school budget to sort of, and they kept on turning it down. They kept on saying, no, nah, this is a stage play. You know, we, we, you know, we, we want you to do some, why don't you write something of your own? And I went, I can't write. I can't, I can't do that. Um, and the writing, the head of writing there was a guy called John Bryce, um, who'd been one of the creators of the Avengers and all those wonderful oh, sort of wow. 1960s, yeah, yeah, yeah. 60s armchairs, things like that. And and really lovely man who really lovely. And I, I, we, you know, we'll talk a bit about teaching, but I think. There are a few teachers one gets in one's life um, who teach you about teaching, and and my and my cello teacher when I was a little boy, and John Bryce were the two people who taught me everything, taught me most of what I know about teaching. I think so. He's an incredibly encouraging source. So he sort of said, "Well, Matthew, you've you've got to write your own thing. Well, next time you have a dream that you're interested in." Just write it down and just write. It. And I had a dream about being in, about seeing, being in a wood, being in a, this is a very typical dream, being in a dark wood, but seeing this old guy who's blind. And, and I, all I did was I was frightened for him because he couldn't see, but he was pulling back the leaves that had fallen. And under the leaves was this golden foot this baby, this child, and and he he was alarmed because it was a baby. But I could see, I could see that this child was glowing and was dangerous, or or don't pick it up. But he did, um, and that was the, all the dream was. Uh, but I but it stuck out for me because it was a it was, you know they say everybody in your dream is a version of you. Mm. But um, but that's what they said. And uh, but in this case, it felt like when I woke up, I was dreaming about somebody else. I was watching it, mm. so I thought, oh, I'll try and write this. So I wrote a very pretentious little script that was more like a tone poem than a script. Um, um, it was called Darkness from the Trees, um, and I so I gave that to John Bryce. And John Bryce poked his head, after reading it, poked his head out of his office and said, Matthew, come in here immediately. Come in now. We must drink some champagne. You know, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, it's like the stuff you couldn't do these days. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and he said, I think you're a writer. And he said, this is a work of genius. This is wonderful. This is great. And he handed it to me. Um, and it was covered in red ink. He, he, he said, but you have a lot of work to do. Matthew, just, just moving on a touch again. I was looking on your excellent website, mjbjacobs.weebly.com. You got it. Yeah. That you offer one-on-one -on -one consultation sessions, both online and via Skype and in person. So tell us about this. Does that take up much of your time? The site needs some love and care. Should yeah. be Zoom rather than Skype. Ah, actually, you know what? Um, I was going to, I was going to mention that. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I, I started, um, I think as I was saying, I, I started teaching yeah. 
around about 2008 and, and uh, was did a bit for UCLA and and then um, as and then uh, and then at University of Texas at Austin and then City College in San Francisco and then University you know Academy of Art University and then I got back into making films um, and didn't really have time to do you know so much of the university stuff yeah. and I really enjoyed um, the process of working with working with new filmmakers and I, and so and and uh, and I've tried to sort of retain my financial independence and part of that is is um, you know is being able to have some income from 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 coaching and and consulting yeah. so and I've never been really I do really, I do enjoy doing script doctor work. You know, sometimes you get script doctor work yeah, where you don't yeah. really pick up a credit, but you get paid to, to sort of help a script that's in production. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 I also really enjoy being in at the start of stuff. Oh, yeah. um, and so, and that's what I enjoy most about, about consulting. So people come on board and I do a free um, half hour um, where we'll just talk. And I'll see whether or not, and we both see whether or not this is this might be a fit. Um, you know whether whether or not they've got something they really want to work on, whatever it is. You know it might be that they're just putting together a concept for a TV show, and they want to they want to make a deck, or, or or they're pulling together a TV show, or they're pulling together a feature, or or they've got some. I'm not, I can't really teach people how to write novels. I've never written a novel, so I'm already not much good there. Yeah. But but um, but we we we'll talk for half an hour, and then they um, and then they get and then uh, and then we set up a sort of plan of action, um, find it and it and the thing about when you get one on one consulting with someone is you can really focus on what you know on what you need um to what you know and also if it's not too expensive i try and keep it i think i try and keep it you know uh, what, under 100 an hour depending upon how many people i'm working with yeah then that means people can come back um uh, you know because there are some coaches who like oh it's, you know i'll charge you at least 500 or 400 oh, yeah. Yeah. i i i think it it makes more sense to have a track record of the stuff that's on that site is way out of di- date actually i just normally run about five or six clients and normally a good 50 percent of those clients get their stuff made which is an amazing hit rate that is yeah um, superb and and uh and they, you know, we end up working together forever. And then they, through word of mouth, um, spread the word. And, and, yeah. and, and uh, suddenly I'll find myself working with an actor who wants to write or a director who needs to write, or, yeah. you know, somebody, somebody like that. And I put aside maybe a day or a day and a half a week yeah. to do it. And, and I enjoy doing it. Final question from me. It's it's been absolutely light, and the time's actually just disappeared. But yeah. can I ask what advice you'd have for a newcomer, someone who's got ambitions as a writer of screenplays and ultimately as as a filmmaker like yourself? Well, really, there's no one path. You can you can um, the there's, 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 there's no no one. <laughs> yes, it's the old adage, isn't it? No, nobody really knows how these things happen. I think I think it's. I think the old adage of staying true to yourself is important. I think try and work out where your best voice is, um, and then and then work with that. I try and work with. I call it. I call it uh, um, your fingerprint question. Not um, I've never like, that before. No, I know. I, mean, I came up with it myself. Really? Uh, it was, uh, I think I did. Um, I kind of. I think I kind of stole the idea from. I was driving along, and, <laughs> and uh, I was driving from from San Francisco to LA, yeah. and uh, my ex-wife had got me a bunch of CDs to, you know, by Susie Orman, you know, how to manage your finances. It was her <laughs> way of saying help. <laughs> <laughs> Self help, <laughs> and um, and and so so. Uh, but she, Susie Orman, had this idea, which is that 
we all have a uh, an approach to to what we do. So I ask people. I think a good question to ask yourself when you're starting out is really what um, what were the very first two films that you adored as a child? Normally, they will never be the same two films as anybody else. Yeah. I have taught lots and lots of people, thousands of people, yeah. and and, I've, and I always start with let's find out what your fingerprint question is. Find these two films for me. It was like uh, it was it was Disney's nineteen sixties Jungle Book, and then oh, yeah, and then two Wizard, Wizard of Oz for me. Yeah, it would have been Wizard of Oz. Then what's the second one? You know, what's the second one? Second one for me was was like was um was uh two thousand and one and my space dad Odyssey. yeah space Odyssey. and yeah. that was, was a couple of, and so stuck in my mind you don't have to have become a filmmaker or anything like that to really ask this question yeah. um it's, this is stuff before you wanted to be a filmmaker so what was your second one do you know what I'm, I'm, I was going to say uh, Doctor Shivago but I'm thinking well, it may have been Space it, Odyssey yeah. you know I watched on the Chihuahua yeah. Abbey Cinema but I was a bit scared the music you know the the the, the, oh, the encore yeah. you know where the apes are on the beach and they pick up the bone they first use start using a tool you know as they yes. sort of that sort of scared me for some reason I think I was about nine ten year old we're about the same age yeah yeah so 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 he he's uh, yeah so so I loved both of them. So when you found those two movies, you know, don't spend normally your first, uh, normally Dr. Shivago would be right. So what would it be? Wizard, did you say Wizard of Oz? Wizard of Oz, yeah. yeah. It was... Wizard, so, so it would probably be Wizard of Oz and Dr. Shivago. So what you do is you then then get, um, you know, I mean, if it was Power Rangers, it would be great. Um, that, you know, it doesn't, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the quality of the project. Um, so, so then get the trailers. Ideally, the trailers from the from the contemporary trailers from when it was made yep. you know so so get the trailers and just watch them and say to yourself well okay what's the linking tissue here what goes on in both of these things that's the same what is the bridge between these two things then fashion that means the most to you you know what i mean that actually means something to you um uh, and it's normally reflects on your life at that time or your relationship with your parents or whatever yeah. is going on yeah. um uh, and and then and then fashion that into a question so you know how you can turn stuff into a question so for and and then keep asking why until you get to the question until your things go in a circle uh, until things start going in a circle and um for me it was I looked at the, both of those songs and I thought, well, what is the similarity between 2001 and Jungle Book? What's going on here that means the most to me? And then I realized they both have extremely unreliable parents. Um, Mowgli's going along with Baloo, mm -hmm. who is tremendous fun and, and, and great to be with. But Bagheera just wants to get Mowgli away from Baloo because they'll never make the man village or whatever because Baloo yeah. keeps on taking him on adventures yeah. and endangering his life um, many times. Um, uh, and I thought, well, that was such fun. That was such fun. That was one of the reasons I loved it. And then I look at 2001, and the real story element there is similarly a very unreliable parent in the form of Hal, the computer, yeah. who ends up being a much more sinister parent yeah. um, and killing killing the astronauts. Um, and so you, so it became a thing about dysfunction, dysfunctional relationship, dysfunctional parents. So I, how do you turn that into a question? So the question is how, how my, my fingerprint questions, how, did, how does one make a, how, how does one make a dysfunctional relationship functional hmm. if you can it's normally a happy film like Empress New Groove yeah. where you have a dysfunctional relationship going on between the arrogant prince who's become a llama um, and uh, and, uh, and Pacha um, and, that, and the only way he can get back to being a human is by being a good friend um, and then I'm making the same movie again um in this dysfunctional relationship i realized i then looked at all the stuff i'd done 
there was always the same question could be applied to it. It can be applied to most drama, let's face it. How does a dysfunctional relationship become functional? So finding that question, but you'll find that everybody has a slightly different question. Then at least you know that you have this, this theme, if you like, that you can keep going back to. Something that you know you can write because yeah. it's, it's who you are. Um, and who am I? It's, it's, you know, it's who you are. Um, and you and you've got this, you've got this, um, you've got this head. Then, apart from that, it's like I was saying before. It really is looking at it like a bit of a business, and, and realizing that you just, you know, somebody's got to make these films. Somebody's got to do it. And if you keep knocking long enough, someone will answer the door. 